Every sound designer is asked to create some sort of a world in sound. And it's most inspiring when the whole movie essentially requires an original new world of sound. <laughs> From the background sounds, the ambiences, the wind, the storms, the hum inside a spaceship, as well as the mechanical sounds of motors and robot arms and legs and treads. The big thing that's unique about sound design and animation um, is the fact that you get nothing for free. You don't get on a set and hear the way the environment sounds naturally or the way somebody walks across a room or just their voice. Wally. But in this case, because there isn't dialogue that often, it puts all this emphasis on every little squeak, beep, squawk. Now they all have to mean something. Or you have to be careful that if you use them, people will think they mean something. The sound that Eve and Wally made, that was their character. That was how people were going to connect to them. Ooh. So you have to be in complete control about whether there should be sound and what sounds they are and how many they are and when they happen. You learn that the most important thing that you can do as a sound designer is to make the right choice for the right sound at the right moment in a film. <laughs> Ben Burt is an Academy Award-winning sound designer who um, did his very first work on the first Star Wars movies. And in many ways, he's considered the father of modern sound design. There are these iconic sounds that everybody knows. And you meet Ben, and it's like meeting your seventh grade science teacher. He is your seventh grade science teacher. He is the guy that you're like, oh, can you explain to me how gravity works? And he will sit down and explain it to you in a way that you completely understand it using sound effects. I wanted to create a sound for Eve's laser gun in her arm. And I discovered uh, years ago that if you strike a slinky-like spring with any object, you don't just get a clunk on the pickup mic or a ping. You get a pew. That happens because the high frequencies travel faster than the low frequencies. So if you listen to the sound far away down the wire, the high frequencies get there first, and then the sort of mid frequencies and the low frequencies. So you get... It's a laser gun. <laughs> Most of my experience in creating sound has been in an era when you could go outside with a small portable tape recorder and gather sounds in the real world. But I've always been fascinated by the roots of sound design for movies, which really goes back to the days when devices were built to create all kinds of sounds. Disney had an artist with them for many, many years named Jimmy McDonald. And over the years, he and his team built hundreds of props which were used to create sounds in the Disney cartoons. <laughs> Disney style was to use musical sounds for sound effects. If a character impacts on the wall, that hit on the wall will probably be a cymbal crash or maybe it's a funny timpani drum being struck. If somebody zipped across the frame, you might hear a whistle or a flute. And it worked well because those kinds of musical sounds could be controlled in the studio. Recording equipment in the earliest days was very bulky. You couldn't take it outside and go on location to record a train. And so the artists at Disney would simulate the sound right there in the studio. These gadgets could be played as if they were musical instruments, and the timing of the sounds could be tailored to exactly match the picture. This is a rain machine 
I have it just loaded in there with, with little finishing nails, nailed all on strips, and then a couple hands full of Mexican peas. And by rotating it slowly, you'll get the rain sound. And then get some high pitch squeaks by getting close. Great. Fortunately, this collection has been preserved by Joe Harrington, sound mixer and sound designer at Walt Disney Imagineering. So I had the opportunity to get a fantastic tour. This is a classic piece of gear. Twist this clockwise, kind of fast. Okay. <laughs> that was an old machine gun. <laughs> Drawbridge chains. Hold that in your hand and pull that back. Okay. Oh yeah, S uh, screen door. Yeah. <laughs> right. Now, see, I would have gone out and tried to find a screen door. You know, going to a lot of trouble, driven somewhere, waited till it was quiet, but here it is right here. Fabulous. It's only been in recent years that I've kind of rediscovered the value of trying to um, stage or construct a device that you can control. In the earliest days of live action film and animation, if they needed wind, they would use a wind machine. And you can go fast, and you can go slow, or you can speed up and create a gust of wind. A lot of the wind that we hear in movies has been this artificial wind, just this canvas being scraped against wood. But actually, I discovered by accident another way to get wind. And that particular sound was used in the big toxic waste storm. Another classic device is the thunder sheet. It's a piece of sheet metal, and you can get a wonderful low frequency rumble out of it. The thunder sheet is used a number of places. I think one of the reasons Ben is so good at his job is because he's a true fan of sound design and he's an avid historian. He's always thinking and always working and he's a total geek about sound. It makes him just that much more knowledgeable about what, what are the options, you know, what has been done and what could be done that hasn't. He's a bit like Mr. Wizard, you know, where you'd stop by his lab and be like, oh, Angus, I'm glad you decided to show up. I'm uh, working on the sound effect for uh, Wally's treads, and I'm combining the sound of a chinchilla mating with a wildebeest driving a cement truck. It was something new for us also at Pixar that we had a sound designer in-house on a film before post, you know? It was a little funny at first for me when um, Andrew would start uh, evaluating sounds that I was making. He would show up and five or six other, a group would show up and they'd all sit around and I'd, I'd play one little sound of a door closing, click, and everybody would think about it and there'd be a discussion. If it was a softer zip line kind of thing, maybe we could get away with keeping it in there. But I think whatever we end up on the final equation, we should let the, key, the what his job is win out. We're dealing with sound effects on our initial rough storyboard reels to a level of commentary and critique that I would usually wait for post-production. That's a little too kazooey. You just want a more sort of a, almost Eve-like, you know, kind of glow. If that squeak like that. sounds kind of sad and you never meant it to sound sad, it'll throw it that way. So you can't ignore it. 